going, everyone? Thanks for having me here. I hope you can hear me. I'm just going to pretend that you can, so everyone stop me if something's going wrong. Uh, my name is Hunter. I'm from Ripe Robotics, and uh, I'm going to be talking about how we built Ripe Robotics, and also sort of presenting from, hey, you can you can just like go and do stuff, and no one will stop you. Uh, so Ripe Robotics is a company. We're trying to automate the harvesting of apples, oranges, and stone fruit. It's a company I started with a friend of mine about two years ago. Uh, so I'm going to take you through the journey of that, how we actually tried to build build this company, how it's going a lot better now than it was at the at the start, uh, and basically how you know you can just jump into these things and if you keep at it and yeah, maybe it'll work. So this is what the robot looked like at the very start. Uh, <clears throat> basically, I had no idea how to how to build a robot. But originally, we thought, okay, we we want to solve fruit picking. We want to get a robot to automatically pick fruit off trees because people are still doing that with their with their hands which is really slow and it should be automated now so we thought okay we can buy a robot and then we can program it to detect the fruit on the tree and then pick it off uh, and turns out robots are super expensive so we couldn't do that uh, so <clears throat> we started designing this this robot to do it ourselves and uh, we didn't really know how to design a robot so i drew these pictures uh, thinking, okay, maybe we should look at doing it in this sort of direction. It carries it in, it's got an arm, it tries to grab the fruit. Uh, and we went out into a couple of a uh, couple of apple apple orchards, took some pictures, and then tried to train the computer to recognize the fruit. Uh, as you can see, it's doing it, it's not doing very it's not doing very well. It, it misses a lot of the apples, and it thinks that things are apples when they're not. So that was the that was the starting point. Hey, we're gonna try and do this thing. Okay, we need someone to build a robot. Can't buy a robot off the shelf, it's too expensive. Let's work out how to build one on our own. Uh, didn't have anywhere to build it, so I asked around and found a friend who had this, this garage. And he said, hey, yeah, you can come and build a robot in my garage, I don't mind. So like, great, okay, got a garage to, to build in now. Uh, it's not big and it wasn't a lot, of, uh, a lot of space, but we were in the city and finding a, a place like this in the city and not having to pay for it was very, very important for us. Uh, then we started trying to get some some funding to actually put this robot together. We couldn't afford even to build a robot by ourselves at, at the start. Uh, but what we built was this little device, which I've only got this old blurry picture yet. And it's a little laser attached to a, a sort of $5 webcam. And when you hold up a, an apple, the laser points at the apple. So you can say, hey, we've got something that can detect that can detect apples. We've, we can actually wire stuff together. Trust us, we can definitely build a robot. Uh, and it sort of worked, like half the time when we, when we did it, it didn't work. One time we were, we were pitching to these people, trying to convince them to give us money, and the guy was bald and the thing just kept pointing at his head, which was like super not, not great, he didn't give us any money. Um, but then anyway, we kept going, we kept applying to these different, there's like programs and things you can apply for, where they'll buy a little piece of the company, uh, and then the company has a little bit of money to, to build stuff. Uh, so we applied to like dozens of these, and eventually uh, the University of Sydney uh, accepted us with a $5,000 grant to try and build this robot, which is great. Uh, so now we've got like a big a proper office that we get to work out of. This is the uh, the shared office space where they, they let us they let us work to, to build this robot. We we're still renting out the little, the, the friend's shed as well. That's why we built it physically and then we had office space to, to actually do the work. Uh, and I took this picture because there were 12 or 15 companies that uh, that were accepted into this, this program at the university. And uh, we were the only ones there working. Uh, m most of the others did sort of normal nine to five sort of things. And this is on a Sunday night, I think, where we're still working at it. Uh, and that might be part of the reason why we're, we're still here, we're still alive. Most companies that have started uh, don't work out after the first year. Uh, and we're still here. I think having worked weekends and nights and just all the time uh, at the start really sort of got that going. Uh, so then we started building a robot. Don't really know how to build a robot. Uh, my background's in software. This is my friend Leo, who I grabbed and I said, "Hey, come build a robot with me." His background's in, in business, and so we started the started the company together. Uh, but neither of us actually knew how to put together put together a machine. Uh, so what we did, we basically went into Bunnings and we got a bunch of these shelving sort of units because they, they were the cheapest bits of metal we could find, and we sort of bolted them together into this uh, into this rail. Um, and we got these uh, electric motors with a chain attached to it, and we made it go up and down the up and down the rail. We blew up like four of those motors because we didn't really know how to wire them together properly. Um, but eventually, we, we got it working, and uh, the robot moved moved up and down the rail. 
Uh, so here's it when it's uh, when it was done. Um, you can see the design we drew on the left didn't know how to do a computer design, so we just drew it on on paper to start with, uh, and then the actual robot on the on the right. So it goes up and down, and there's a little camera on the end there. And uh, if you hold up an apple or you put an apple in front of it, it'll go up and then it'll move forward and it'll tap. It'll tap the apple, uh, spinning side to side and going in and out and, and picking the fruit. Uh, then we put this tree, like we, we tied this, <laughs> I went down the, the road, cut off a branch of someone's tree. Uh, hopefully they didn't mind. Tied it up here and taped some apples to it in order to do the, in order to do the tests. Because uh, we're in the city and we don't have any actual apple trees to, to test on. But uh, having this was was great because it meant that we, now that we, we'd spent all of the first $5,000 we had on building this robot uh, and we're really running out of money because I quit my job to, to do this and we didn't have any, any any money. But it meant that when we were bringing in other people to convince them to invest in the company, we actually had something to show them, like have a physical thing to show them that can uh, move up and, and tap pieces of, pieces of fruit. It's not much of a, a look of it, actually having something physical, we think really, really helped uh, with that. Uh, and then also through the university, they let us do this presentation thing. Uh, so we've got working robot. We got to present to a bunch of uh, a bunch of people at the university, which looks very you know legitimate and proper. And we've also got the design of the next version of the robot, so you can see, okay, you guys have worked out what's working and what's not working, and you've worked out how to fix it. So now we we go around and we try to convince people to buy a little piece of the company. Uh, so yeah, the way it works is you sell a small small bit of the company. And then the money that people buy that with goes into the company, not to you. Uh, and then the company has more money to, to keep doing development work. Um, so we, we didn't know any of these people beforehand. Some of them we met through the university program. One of them I met in the library just because I was working on it in the library one day and someone walked over and I was like, yeah, I'm building a robot. If you want to give me some money to keep building the robot? And he said, yes. Another I met at a, a dinner, which was like a free, a free dinner for like, you could just go to like these robotics clubs and things. But people crawl out of the work and then they got their friends and eventually we had uh, enough people to put, bring together for us to have $70,000 to build the next version of the robot, which is a big, big step up. Uh, so now we're building the next version of the robot, version, version two, uh, except we got kicked out of the, the garage we're in because COVID happened and they didn't want anyone coming to that building anymore who wasn't living there, uh, which is a problem because $70,000 is enough to, to build you know, build a full full machine and, and get a trailer to take it and get a car to drive it to the, to the orchards and do these tests. But it's not enough to rent out a shed in Sydney because uh, it turns out they're super expensive. So we had nowhere to actually build it. So we thought, okay, let's go back to Bunnings, get more of that shelving unit and just build a giant tent. Uh, this is my backyard and now we're building this big tent in the in the backyard to put the, put the robot in and do all the building there. I don't know if like you're allowed to do that, but no one stopped us. So I guess that's the point of the, the talk. You can just do things and people will stop you if you're, if you're, if you're doing something wrong. Um, yeah, so anyway, I convinced my housemates to let, to let me do that. And we built this, built this uh, tent and then we built the next version of the robot in the tent, uh, which, was, which was great. We're actually too late for the apple season. It took us too long to put the robot together. So we sort of shifted and we're like, okay, let's try to pick, let's try to pick oranges as well. Uh, so this is version two. You can see it's way better than the first version. It can actually go out into the field. It can find the oranges on the tree and it can it can pick them off the off the actual tree, and then we've got this uh, cool tube thing, which actually we patented, which is which is awesome, uh, that moves the fruit all the way from the tree down into the bin at the back of at the back of the robot. Uh, you'll notice the robot sitting on top of a, a car trailer. We've, we've we've bought a sort of a trailer, and we've thought, okay, that'd be nice and easy. We'll put the robot on top of it, bolt it all in, and then when we drive it around to different farms to do these tests, uh, it'll be really easy. But it turns out after we put the robot on it, it wasn't road legal. So we actually had to get a second trailer and put the first trailer on top of the second trailer in order to take it anywhere. Uh, so I guess that's another big, big lesson is that your original ideas are always wrong. But if you don't try them, then you won't find out why they're wrong. So, so yeah, uh, now I've got the second version of the machine and we've spent all our money and we're like, okay, great. Let's try to get more money to build a third version of the machine. We build up a good sort of business plan and all of that fancy stuff meant to have when you when you make a, a company. Uh, we did the we got some customers. We spoke to a bunch of farmers, a bunch of growers, and said, "Hey, we're trying to build this machine. If it works, would you use it commercially?" They said yes. We said, "Would you sign something that says you use it commercially so that we can go and raise money?" And they said yes, which is great. Uh, we started getting some publicity and media, which is super useful. 
because uh, if you're trying to convince people to sign up to use the machine or if you're trying to convince people to give you more money to build another machine being in all the newspapers is really uh, is really awesome um, so we kept doing these tests the machine kept getting better we kept making little improvements to it we've got a little that you see the little robot in the front there we built to sort of drag it drag the drag the the robot along um, and basically it's getting better we're finding the mistakes we're finding the bugs and, and building new thing uh, but then we still we couldn't get funding uh, which that machine, I guess, wasn't good enough to, to, to get funding. We weren't good enough at pitching, we weren't good enough at, at finding people uh, or companies to try and invest in this. So we changed tracks a bit. We realized, what are we doing in, in the city? There's no fruit in the in the city. So we moved down here to, to Shepparton um, and we spoke to some growers here and we said, hey, do you have a, like a shed we can rent out of to keep building these robots? And they said, yeah. Uh, so now we rent out a shed here, which is much cheaper compared to Sydney prices. Um, I live on I live on the farm here, which also keeps it nice and nice and cheap. And then we worked out we had enough money to do an upgraded frame of the robot. So we did version three, but it's actually just the frame that's new. All the other pieces of the robot, all the motors, all the electronics, cameras, everything, we're just ripping out of the second version and putting it into the third version. So it's not too expensive to do. Uh, so then we build that, and here it is heading out for its first test. Uh, look, that's the one from the from the, the first picture there. Uh, so this robot looked way better. It's the full commercial system. You look at it and you say, yeah, I can see how that would be that would be commercial. It doesn't wobble as much as the other one did. It works a bit better, it works a bit faster. It's got it's got everything you need to be a commercial commercial robot. Um, and we borrowed some money to be able to build it as well because we had to buy this generator and stuff. So we didn't have money, so we had to borrow some to, to do that. Uh, and then we went out to test it and make a lovely video of it in the field and see if it actually could pick fruit. Uh, and the tanks, the units, the, the 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 wheels at the bottom couldn't turn. They they didn't work the way we thought they would. So we had to carry the machine. We borrowed a forklift to carry the machine out into the field, because uh, just because it doesn't drive, then doesn't mean we can't do the other tests. Uh, so you know, you find ways around it to be able to get out there. So we took it out there, and then we got these lovely pictures of this robot in in the field. We picked a bunch of uh, a bunch of apples just to, as as a test. Lots of things went wrong. Didn't really have enough suction. The tube kept kept breaking. It still wobbled a little bit too much. Found some found some problems, but we were able to see. Okay, this is working. This is working. This is working. This isn't working. This isn't working. This isn't working. And also, we we're able to take you know a lovely video and a nice little picture of it in the field. Uh, and it it looks very real. You know now it's in the in the field. Uh, so we went back and tried to raise tried to raise money again based on that. And what was important this time is that. We can show, hey, we've got number one, number two, and number three. And so if we're saying we're doing number four, and you can see that beautiful progression of improvements, then that's that's kind of persuasive. That's like, yeah, okay, I can see how you're going to get to something that's able to pick ten thousand apples or hundred thousand apples instead of just hundred, which is all we all we've really done. Um, so I think that was that that was a persuasive part of it, uh, and also the fact that you know we we've been working at it for two and a half years and that hadn't. We were still going, you know, we were still still working, still getting there. Uh, we had customers, we had a good business plan. We got better and better at, at, at pitching the company. Um, so now we've we've succeeded in, in in raising the money to build version four, and the company is growing in size. We're going up to five people instead of two, and we've got enough money to build uh, at least one more robot, maybe two or three more. Uh, and the goal is to get the next the next robot to be able to pick you know, tens of thousands of, of, of apples, and hopefully that'll be the last last iteration so, so to become to become commercial. We'll keep iterating after that, but uh, this one was the one we needed to to actually for the company to start making money rather than relying on uh, on investment money. Um, yes, that's, that's all good fun. That's the story of the, the, the company. Um, I guess my point in, in, in telling that is that, hey, you can just uh, you can just do these things. I didn't really know how to build a robot at, at the start. Leah didn't either. No one really believed we could at the start either. Uh, but because we gradually kept improving uh, and now have a robot that can that can pick fruit, uh, now everyone takes us like super seriously and we get invited to events like this and get invited to, to uh, other things. And you know, all the, the PhDs and fancy people at the start uh, who you know we couldn't convince to start the company with us, People of that caliber are now applying for jobs with us, which is fantastic. Um, so yeah, good, good, good fun there. Don't uh, necessarily need to work for a big company. You can do your own stuff if you want. Thank you, Hunter, for that amazing presentation. Um, 
We have quite a lot of questions. Um, first question is, what are you wearing? Are you meant to be a giant orange? Uh, sorry, I, I, don't, I don't know what you mean. This is just my outfit. This is just my uh, uniform for the company. I have to wear this every day, actually. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, next question is, what are your secrets behind getting to where you have got to write robotics? Secrets behind getting where we had to, uh, I guess just like trying things, even if it feels like you can't really do it. Um, there was a lot of stuff like that, like say for building the, the, the suction tube to get the fruit off the, off the tree. Uh, I'm like, okay, it must be possible to move an apple from here to, to there using, using suction. We couldn't get it to work, uh, but we knew it was possible. Um, because there's definitely enough air going through for it to, to, to bring the apple through. So we like we kept trying like dozens and dozens of different versions of this of this tube uh, until we figured out, okay, you need to make a seal on the apple and it's not the airflow, it's the pressure. So if you make a seal on the fruit, then you can move it, move it down a bit. Uh, and then you need to make another seal and another seal. So the tube ended up being like hundreds of these sort of seal things uh, in, a, in, in a row. Uh, and it turned out no one had done that before, and we're able to 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 get a patent on it. Um, the other companies that tried to do to do fruit picking with with, with suction uh, just made the vacuum stronger, which we couldn't do because that's too expensive. Uh, so yeah, we knew something was possible, and then we figured out how to do it. And uh, you know, didn't didn't wait for someone like we didn't say, oh, we better take it to the expert of making of, of transporting fruit. We just like let's try to figure that out. Uh, Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. We tried to make our own vacuum, didn't work at all. Turns out vacuums are really hard to make. But uh, other times it works great and then you have something new. Yeah. yeah. Um, Hunter, what do you love most about your job? Ooh. I like that if I think that something is useful or important to do within the, the company, I can just do it. There's no one, like I don't have a, a boss that tells me, hey, you got to work on this today. And, you know, and we work at other uh, other companies. I worked as, as a software engineer and stuff at other other companies in the past. And they put you on something and you're like, I don't think this thing is, is very important. Or I don't think this is the best way to, to do it. But because you're, you're, you're junior or because, you know, uh, you know the, the other people have to think it's a good idea, you're sort of stuck with it. And you have to sort of force yourself to work at it. And it's not, sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong, but it's not as much, much fun to do. Uh, Whereas with this, we're like, okay, I want to try it. I think we've got an idea for how to do this piece better, or I've got an idea for what direction we should go in there. And we just, you know, we just get to try it, you know? Yeah. What is the b worst and best decision you have ever made? Hmm. Good question. Uh, I'll, I'll, lim I'll limit it to within the, the sort of company time period. Worst decision would be we spent a long time at the start uh, sort of, I was working part time on this because I started to have another job in order to eat, uh, doing like heading down a direction which was just wrong. We were trying to get computer, we we're trying to detect the fruit on the, on the tree. And so we built this whole big sort of virtual environment thing to generate fake pictures so that we could train the uh, train the, the image system. And it took ages to build that program. We built one to detect apples and another one to detect oranges and another one to do the self-driving stuff. And it kind of worked pretty well. We got like 99% of the way there and it kind of was able to train the images properly, but we stuck at it for way too long. Um, it, was, it was dumb to try and build something that would work at, at really big scale, so making hundreds of thousands of pictures, uh, rather than just, let's just label a, a hundred pictures ourselves and see how far we get with that. It would have taken, you know, a hundredth the amount of time just to manually label the pictures and see see how many we actually needed, rather than building a whole big program to generate uh, fake images, which we didn't end up using. It turns out it wasn't it wasn't accurate enough. It didn't the images the, the pictures we were generating weren't weren't good enough to real life. Uh, Best decision for the company was probably doing the shift to actually come down to Shepparton. We didn't think of that beforehand. Like, okay, we've just got to keep paying high sort of Sydney rents 
and being sort of stuck in, uh, in Sydney, not being able to test easily. But uh, moving down here was a huge benefit because like you get to got more space to test, to, to work on the robot. Uh, it's, it's cheaper to rent out the space to, to, to build the robot. Um, and we get to test it. Like you can just drive it right outside. Before we had to have, we spent a whole day loading it onto a trailer and tying it down and driving it sort of five hours to the nearest orchard. Whereas here it's right here. So that was definitely the biggest, biggest shift. And it took us embarrassing long, embarrassingly long time to think of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you were to be placed in a high school student's shoes, what would you recommend them to do? Hmm. I guess it depends what what they would actually want to do. I think that if they want to get into to, to tech or IT, like they should definitely learn stuff themselves. Like there's great online courses to learn AI uh, or learn, learn different parts of, of programming or learn how to do stuff. And the courses are a lot better online than they are if we go through like a university or, or something like that. Um, especially if you're trying to build something yourself. It's the fastest way to learn something is to try and build something yourself. And then each time you get stuck, then you can look up, okay, where's a two hour course on how to solve this problem that I'm having at the moment. That's a lot more efficient than sort of saying, okay, I want to do software, so I'm going to commit to doing a four year degree, and then maybe in five years time, I'll be able to work on software. Uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't do the four year degree as well, but if you want to uh, learn stuff quickly and get really good at it quickly, then you just got to jump in and do it, and do it, do it yourself. Um, yeah, in, in a broad sense as well, I think artificial intelligence is, is the place to be. Like if you're getting into to AI, definitely go into artificial intelligence. Um, not definitely, but if you have any interest in, in maths, the math side of it particularly, AI is really, really exploding. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is something you think high school students need to work on? Are there any inspiring quotes or places we should attend to get the best career we want? Mm. I don't really have anything for, for that. I think that doing doing your own projects, even if the project doesn't work out, I did like 10 of these before we got one, which actually is is running pretty well, uh, is is important. I don't really have any good, good quotes or anything. Uh, being part of groups that are doing stuff is also very, very handy. Um, like uh, we're doing this with, with my friend Leo, made it so it was a lot easier for us to keep keep working at it you know whereas if you're doing something on your own you can easily sort of get get stuck going down a rabbit hole or a direction which doesn't actually make sense so you sort of need it's a lot easier if you have two people to bounce ideas off each other and it's a lot more fun too but yeah i don't know if that really answers it but that's what i'm gonna say yeah um what drew you or inspired you to make a giant robot um I was trying to work out how I could have an impact on the future in a sort of shortish time frame. Uh, like, what are, what are the things you can do which is going to maximize uh, the the impact you can have on the on, on the future? If you, if you have another, if, like, if you if you take a, a job, say say you really care about, uh, let's pick a, a health. If, if you really care about helping sick people, one option is to go and become a, a doctor and, and help sick people. But the, what you're, if you look at a sort of bigger level, what, what you're doing there, you're only improving it however much better you are than the, than the doctor that would have got that job, you know? Like if you become a doctor and get a job, that job still would have been there if you, if you, didn't, uh, if you didn't become a doctor. It just would have gone to a slightly worse doctor because they picked you because you're, you're better, so they would have gone to the, a slightly worse one. So it's hard to have a big impact if you stick in normal sort of, normal sort of careers. Uh, at least not for a long time until you reach the top of these these big companies. So if you want to have a, a sort of big or measurable impact quickly, you've got to take big risks uh, and create stuff or create jobs or create uh, projects that wouldn't have existed at all unless you, you made them in the first place. Um, yeah, that's kind of how I think about it. Um, yeah. Um, how did you start advertising this giant robot? Um, we actually, it's, people were super, like, happy to chat with us, which was great. Before this, I tried to do a company that was doing mobile, mobile games, 
and no one wants to talk about about mobile games. You know, we call up a journalist or we call up a sort of potential customer and be like, hey, let's try to make mobile games. And they'd be like, not like they wouldn't even reply, not interested at all. Whereas with this, you know, we call up a, a fruit grower to start to try and learn about how to pick fruit or to see if they might be interested in using a in using a machine like this. And they'll chat for hours with us about it, you know, just cold call a random person from the from the yellow pages and they just chat for ages about it. So like, okay, they're definitely there's definitely something here. Um, or when we do the same for a journalist, they'd be interested, you know, they'd actually call us back and be like, hey, yeah, we'd like to like to do a story about that. Um, so I think it's partially just because people like robots. Um, it, it was a lot easier to, to get publicity. Um, yeah. And also because we're actually doing stuff, you know, we've got a physical thing here and we've been into the into the field uh, and it's all like it's there, you know, it's not just a, a render, it's not just a picture, it's not just an idea. Um, so it took a long time before it started to snowball and people were more and more interested. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Um, when you built a giant robot, why did you build a robot for specifically fruit? Good question. Um, so we're looking at, okay, how, because I, I, I'd worked as a software person before in, in AI, like what, what could we do where there's no big company currently doing it? Uh, where it wouldn't be easy for a big company to come in and start doing it, where it's not a sales problem, because you don't want to get in a situation where you've built something and then the whole, the difficult part is to try and sell it. You want to build something where people really, really, really want it and they don't have to worry about selling it because they really want it. The, the difficult part is building it in the first place. Uh, so then when we sort of started looking around for stuff like that, um, there are autonomous tractors that some company is developing, so they really want to go into there. There's autonomous sprayers, uh, there's autonomous mowers, but fruit picking was still like people doing it with their hands, like one at a time picking fruit off the off the tree. And it's really bloody hard work. Um, and also there's not enough people doing it, so there's a big demand there. Uh, so it seemed like, okay, if we can build a robot that can that can pick the fruit, then we can also, like maybe we'll be able to reduce the damage, maybe we'll be able to get the fruit at exactly the right time, which is kind of tricky for, for people to do. Maybe we'll be able to do all, all different varieties of fruit that grow on trees. Uh, maybe we'll be able to gather, gather data so we can count the number of fruit, how large it is, if it's ripe, all that useful stuff. So it seemed like a good good starting place because you got all these uh, all these things to expand to and no one else is really doing it at the moment. There's a couple of little, like there's a university project here and a small company here, but you could count up the number of people working on it on, on like two hands. So it's not a, not a huge, not a huge uh, group, yeah. Yeah, um, I think we just have time for one final question. Have we considered to build another robot for something else other than fruit? We will eventually, but we've got to, yeah, that's a good good uh, thing to emphasize. Like you really got to stay focused on getting this robot to, to work commercially well. So it kind of works, but we need to get it to a commercial level before we try to do something else. Uh, because if we shift or if we split our focus, then that's when we'll uh, that's when we'll you know slow down and and not be not be successful. We'll run out of money because we'll be doing multiple different things rather than just getting one thing to work well. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Hunter, for sharing your insights and sharing your experience about IT careers. Thanks, guys.